Hi everyone, uh, welcome to episode 9 of In The Fox's Den. Anybody who remembers clubbing in the 80s, as I do, will remember dancing along to a band called Modern Romance, who had an awful lot of hits in the early to mid 80s. And today I'm very pleased to say that I've got with me Andy Kiriaku, who still tours as Modern Romance. Andy. Hello, Hello mate. Hello, Rick. How are you doing? All right? Uh, yeah, fine. You've got a lot of stuff up on your walls there. Oh, um, yeah, I have. I'm just looking at the camera. Yeah, I've got loads of. Well, you don't no, like it. You know, I've got Arsenal memorabilia this side. Yeah, there's far too much Arsenal memorabilia up there for me, mate. I'll swivel you around slightly. That way you see some gold discs and things and stuff over there. And uh, basically, this is where I, this is where the band rehearsed. It's where I spend most of my time. So I've got my laptop here. I've got a TV so I can keep myself entertained. Um, drum kit, keyboard, so it's all, all happens in here. Must, but, you know, when the kids aren't here, um, nine times out of ten, you'll find me in this room for hours. Just doing stuff in there. Well, talking about the band, um, you kind of grew up like me um, and went clubbing in the eighties. So tell us, uh, tell us a little bit about that time. Actually, I, I must be older than you. I started clubbing in the seventies, so I'm obviously a bit older than you. Oh, maybe I was just a late starter, mate. Yeah. Well, I was out in the seventies listening to a lot of the soul stuff there, which is very, actually very influential musically. Um, but then obviously we moved into the 80s and this new romantic stuff came out and uh, I remember watching Top of the Pops and watching all these new bands, um, you know, Madness and things like that and I thought, yeah, you know, some of this stuff's really good. Always wanted to be on top, always, well, I say always, from the time I realised I wanted to be a musician, Top of the Pops was, that was it, that was, you know, the, the, that was the pinnacle. You had to get on Top of the Pops. Um, you know, to, to acknowledge to yourself more than anything else that you've made it. Um, so I used to watch it every week. It was like, you know, the Bible. You have to watch it every week. You have to watch it. Um, and I remember, um, you know, as I said, seeing all these bands and just, you know, somewhere in the back of my mind was this thing that, well, you know, I'd love to be on there. And I was playing music at the time. Um, and I would be at home, you know, playing, you know, Playing for hours and just imagining there was an audience, imagine there were a crowd there, and that you're playing to the crowd, you know. Um, it's something probably every, most musicians do. It's like footballers, you know, when you play in the park, you know, you get the ball and you imagine you're doing a Ronaldo moment or Messi, you're doing something really amazing. And, um, and it's the same with musicians. We all, all aspire to doing something great and being acknowledged for it. Yeah, that, that's the biggest reward. Someone acknowledging that what you're doing is valid, it's good, it's enjoyable, it gives people pleasure. Um, and was it always the drums for you, Andy? Do you know what? Until the age of about 14, it was nothing. I was just like listening to music. Um, and what happened was somebody in my class, who was a good friend of mine at the time, said, I've just bought a drum kit. And I went, really? You know, totally disinterested. Yeah, really? I was going, oh, yeah. And I was around his house all the time. All the time. I was around his house probably four out of five days after school and I'd meet up with him at the weekend. Um, so I went around to see this kit. And to be honest, it was a load of rubbish. But I didn't know any better at the time. For me, it was a drum kit. There it was. It was brilliant, you know. And um, he, he, just, he couldn't play. He just bought a drum kit because he fancied it. And um, I think he used to play snare drum in the boys' brigade or something. Um, so he thought he'd get a drum kit at some point. Um, so I sat down with the sticks, first time I've ever held drumsticks in my life. And I said, oh, let's have a go. So I got them and I just went, poof, 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 poof. From that second, I went home and I said, right, what do I do? So I went out the next day and bought a set of drumsticks and then found boxes at home, literally cardboard boxes. Well, of course, even though I couldn't drum, um, you know, I, I knew nothing about drumming, it was all being self-taught. The box didn't last very long because you're thrashing it with these drumsticks. It, 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 there were shreds everywhere, I was drumming and bits going all over the place. So after about a week, this box hadn't lasted really very long, not even that. Um, so I decided, well, why don't I just drum on the bed? 
So I would sit by the side of the bed, same position every day, and just drum in the bed, on the bed. Like. Two things wrong with this. All you aspiring drummers, get a drum kit, don't do this. Because the first thing is, I wore, I literally wore a hole into the, it was an Ida down, I can't remember in those days. So I wore a hole in it because I was sitting there drumming, drumming, going every day, every day. Eventually I walked in one day and I looked and there was a, a patch that was like seat through and I thought, oh my God, I'm going through it, you know. But aside from that, the other thing which uh, really doesn't help as a drummer is I learned to play, A, without using my legs, so it's just, without using my feet, so it was just hands. Um, but the other thing is that once you start playing a, a proper drum kit, there's this bounce that didn't exist when you had the bed, because the bed just hit it, just boom, that's it, just it's dead. All of a sudden, you hit the drumstick, and, it, and it's, it's actually like a recoil. And I was losing sticks all over the place when I first got a drum kit, and I thought, Oh yeah, didn't take this into account. Did it? But um, so what happened was I did that for ages, and the one good thing about it is that I built up my stamina because I was listening to albums at the time. Let me see if you remember this, right? I was listening to one of the albums I listened to, or two of them, were Pile Driver and Hello, both by Status Quo. Yeah. And I, you know, I used to drum to them and um, literally end to end, one album to the other one. I mean, initially, I couldn't, I'd, I'd do like a, a 10, 15 minutes and be completely, that's it, I'm done, I'm not doing anymore. But gradually, I started getting you know, more and more used to it. And I would sit there dripping in sweat, drumming to these songs, because they're all up tempo, like really high energy songs, um, all the way through to you know, both, the end of both albums. Um, I was a mad Bowie fan at the time, absolutely loved Hunky Dory, Ziggy Stardust, um, Aladdin Sane when that came out. So I would be drumming to those songs as well. Um, so, what happened was this guy that I bought the drum kit from, young Fred, Fred Beach was his name, says one day, I'm selling my drum kit. And I thought, hang on. So I bought it for 25 quid. Now, it was rubbish. I actually stripped it down to the bare wood because they're all different colours and all different things. I just took all the enamel things off the outside. Stripped it down to bare wood, varnished it, put it all back together. So it's basically a varnished drum kit, you know, wood wood finish, wood grain finish. Um, but it was it was good enough to learn on. Um, yeah. and, I'm, and I'm guessing that your um, neighbours probably preferred you drumming on the bed, didn't they? My neighbours hear another story. I mean, I, just fast forward for years, we had trouble with the neighbours. Absolute. We had fights in the street, literally. Over I, your drumming. Yeah, yeah, with, I had a fight with the next door neighbour um, and his dad, two of them, right? Because I was drumming. And, um, but funny enough, fast forward to Top of the Pops, I do Top of the Pops one night, walk out the next day, hello, we saw you last night on the TV. This is the same people that I've been fighting with for years. And I thought, oh, all of a sudden you'll be my friend now. Cause you and so, that, suddenly I'm you were a TV star. Yeah. Well, let, yeah. let's come on to that. Let's come on to you joining Modern Romance. Because that was your your first band, wasn't it? You went straight well, to the moment. That wasn't my first band, actually. Not my first band of any notoriety. But funny enough, going back, let's go back two seconds to that drum oh, kit. Right. That drum kit, I then went and auditioned for a band. And they were called Headquarters, Soul Band. Yeah. And I have to quote, they said to me, you know what, for a white boy, you're really quite funky. Because I didn't think a white guy was going to play the soul stuff the way I did, you know. But going back to the 70s, I was a soul fan. I was brought up on all that stuff. Yeah. It was in there. So when I started drumming, I'd be drumming to all that average white band. I started going into that. So they said, it's really good. You know, we love your drumming, but you can't possibly come on stage with that kit. So you have to buy a new kit. And I said, but I've just left school. I'm, I'm going to college. How can I buy a drum kit? The reason I mentioned that is, I just stayed friends with the name, and later on, um, they broke up into two bands. You know, so half went that way and half went that way. Some of them became a band called Central Line. I don't know if you remember a band called Central Line. Yeah, yeah, I remember them very well. Right? Well, they became Central Line. And the other lot became another band that you may have heard of called Lynx, with David Grant. Yeah. 
So I'm sitting there thinking, I could have been in either one of these two bands and I'm sitting here doing nothing, you know. But then uh, having said that, a few months after thinking that, because they were both, I saw Central Line on TV and I found out the internet at the time, I said, oh, great, I saw you, brilliant. Uh, then a couple of months later, I'm on top of the pops, out of, the, out of nowhere. And I thought, how bizarre the way things work out. Very strange. Well, what, okay, so let's come on now to you joining Modern Romance. Were these a group of friends that you, that you no, had already? No, I didn't know them at all. I actually went to, um, do you remember the Blitz? Yeah. Right, well, I went to the Blitz one night with a friend of mine. And it, it goes to show sometimes, had I not gone to the Blitz that night, there's a very good chance that you and I wouldn't be having this conversation because I wouldn't have been in Modern Romance. Who knows? Because that night I went to the Blitz and... Let, let's explain first of all that the Blitz was a very well-known club during, during well the for anybody who doesn't know what that was. Yeah, and it was, um, it was the band where it was that, the club where the New Romantic movement is said to have started because a lot of the people like Steve Strange, um, yeah. Spandau Ballet, all the people who were going down there so I just popped in one night. I mean, I, I just left the band that I was in. I, was in a few, I, was, I played in a jazz punk band. I played in a blues band. I played in a rock and roll band, like proper 50s rock and roll. Um, so I, I went in there just to, it was a friend of mine, just to see what was going on. Not band-wise, but I didn't even realise I'd had a band that night. I just went in clubbing. So I'm out clubbing every night, which we'll come back come to in a while. But, um, so I went there with a friend and I saw a band packing up. So I was like, oh, we've missed the band, you know, I'd love to watch a live band. So um, I'd ask someone, I said, oh, what was this band like? You know, and they said, oh, they were pretty good, actually. And the one thing they said, that it's, it's funny, it's a key word. One of them said, yeah, yeah, they were pretty good, actually. In actual fact, they were quite funky. I'm like, really? Okay. So I went over and started chatting to the then drummer. I said, do you know any other bands that need a drummer, like your band, that play funky stuff? I just assume when they said funky, they meant funky as in proper funk. Um, and he said, no, but he said, but give me a number and I'll see what I can do. So I went, all right, your number. I get a call a few days later saying, would you like to play percussion for us? And I said, yeah, what am I? You know, bit conga, bit of timbales, we can do that. Um, I said, yeah, all right, we'll sort out getting together, having a rehearsal, whatever, right, fine. A few more days passed, and I get another phone from saying, forget that, do you want to be our drummer? And I said, hang on a minute, you've got a drummer. He's the one who gave you my phone number. Now, we're getting rid he doesn't know we were getting rid of him anyway, if you're around. And I went, yeah, but hang on. I said, how can you ask me to join? I said, you don't know me, you haven't even heard me. Well, you know, I can't play, I think I can play, you know. And it turned out that one of the bands, the Rob the Keyboard Player, I think was, had been to another club called Monkbury's a few months earlier, where our, the band, the last band that I was in had played. And he went back home and accused him and saying, what a great band, blah, blah. So they said to me, well, if you were in that band, if that was you, and I said, yeah, that was me. Well, okay, he said, right, then you're in. So then what I had to do is I thought, well, hang on a minute. So I thought, well, I can't just join a band without knowing how did they are. So I said to them, well, I need to come and hear you. So I thought, I'm not joining a band, but it turns out they're rubbish. And I went to, I don't know if you know, do you know the bridge house that was in Canning Town? Yeah, I actually played at the bridge. Right. I, I actually played at the bridge house, so yeah, I know it very well. Right, well, I went to the bridge house in Canning Town to watch Modern Romance, this, the band, I don't know, called Modern Romance, and I, I watched them and I thought, there's something about this band. I didn't know what it was. Um, I didn't think the singer could sing very well. I thought it was pretty awful, to be honest. <laughs> But the general sound in the band and the rawness, there was kind of like a raw energy with it. And I thought, yeah, I like this. And I thought, I could see myself playing this stuff. So I thought, yeah, okay, we'll give it a go. And um, agreed to join them. And then was faced with the prospect of going around and telling my typical Greek Cypriot parents, you know, emigrated from Cyprus, come here. Uh, by the way, do you remember when I packed in my job as in the bank to go and become, a, a, in their eyes, a lowly van driver? Because I wanted the van to drive around after work, you know, to, to yeah. drive my drums with me. They thought I was mad and I did that. Now I'm going back and saying, you know this job I've got as a van driver? Yes. Well, I'm giving that up as well now. 
to go and sign on the dole and join this band. And I thought they must have been very happy with you, Andy. They were ecstatic. I can't tell you how happy they were because they weren't. <laughs> so how so how long after that? Let's move forward a bit. How long after that did you make them happy by having your first hit and getting on top of the pops, which had always been your dream? Right. Well, this was the thing. When I joined them, they were just the band, and I thought, well, we'll give it a go. You know, they're saying good. Uh, there's something I like about them. I'd rather join a band that I like the sound of and see what you can do rather than join a band that's just for the sake of it, you know. Let's join this lot. I actually like what I heard. Um, and then we're having a rehearsal, I think it's the first rehearsal, in underneath the railway arches in Leighton. And during a, a break with you know the music somewhere, so I mentioned the record company and I said, sorry, what was that? You know, oh yeah, we've got a deal with the record company. We've got a deal with Warner Brothers. I went, really? I said, yeah. But we've had two flops already, and they said if the next record's a flop, they're throwing us off the label. So was so, that was that when they were Leighton Buzzards? No, no, no. After Leighton Buzzard, they'd signed to Warner Brothers as Modern Romance yeah. and released two records, both of which bombed abysmally. Um, one of them was particularly rubbish, to be honest. It was horrible. <laughs> but the other one, the other song called Tonight, I, we used to play it live and I loved playing it. I thought it was a great song. Um, but still, that didn't get anywhere. But this is all before me, obviously. I was just joined to be told we've had two flop singles. And if we have one more, three strikes and you're out. That's it, you're on your, on your way. And I thought, okay, you know. I didn't join because they had a record club, they had a record club. I was totally unaware, but I thought, okay, that's a bonus, interesting. Anyway, so the first record, so, so the, the next thing we're going to release, the next, yeah, the next song we're going to release is this song called Everybody South. And I listened to it. And bearing in mind, I've come from a musical background up until that time of mainly funk, jazz funk. You know, I love jazz funk. Yeah, I used to love listening to instrumentals, all the musicians showing off their stuff. Yeah, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. And um, so also I'm in the band, and they're going to, not only are they singing, which I particularly hate, I didn't really like singing. Um, I didn't like the idea of someone singing. I wanted to do the music, the singing, I'll do that to the side of the singing. Um, totally different now, I've changed completely, but that's concerned. But at the time I was quite, I'd say narrow-minded musically where that's concerned. I just became focused on music, uh, you know, the musical side of things. Yes, I loved all the soul songs and stuff in Motown and Philadelphia, but when it came to me playing music, I was interested in playing in a band where I had keyboard players that played in 20 minute solos and the bass players went off and guitarists. Yeah. Everyone did their bit and showed off how good they really were. And I thought, oh, I love all that. Uh, and then all of a sudden, I'm in this band that we, they're not only playing pop music, it's everybody sounds so, you know, we're all singing along, chanting stuff. And I'm, I don't know about this, but I liked all the other stuff. And I'm like, well, listen, you know, it's not my choice, it's not my decision as to what to put out as a single. I've just joined, let's just go with the flow. Eight weeks after joining, I'm on top of the pops. Now, eight weeks is a long time to wait eight weeks, but when you think about it in real terms, you know, it's like being signed to play for, I say Arsenal, I suppose, being signed to play for Arsenal as a young. As a 17 year old, we'll sign you to play you know, as in, in the, you know, the youth team. And then eight weeks later, you're playing up front against Man United in the Premier League. It was like, it was like those things. It was like, what the hell happened? You know? um, what, and what, what got that going actually is um, at the time, nobody was doing PAs. It was a relative, well, very new thing to do a personal appearance. Um, and I spoke to a friend of mine. Do you remember a club called Ombres? Did you ever used to go to no, Ombres? I don't remember that. In Well Street. Anyway, the, the DJ there said to me, Why don't you come and do a PA here with me? Because I knew him anyway. And he said, You join this band, come and do a PA here. And I went, All right. So I went to do this PA and it went blindingly. Amazing. Everyone loved it. It was fantastic. So the, somebody in the band was talking about doing a tour, which is very expensive. And if the record company aren't willing to put the money into you, um, then it's not going to happen. So I then suggested, why don't we do a tour of PAs, where we basically, well, we, we did it, and then we drove to, for example, Birmingham. We'd do a PA at 10 o'clock in one club, be out of there by, half, you know, be, be up, arrive there at half nine, do the PA at 10, be out by 11, and by 11.30, 
be on 12 o'clock, be in Wolverhampton and do one there. Or start another club in Birmingham and then stay the night and the next day go somewhere. So all we had to do was pay for hotels for the van and the transport. There was, there was no equipment, no roadies, no setting up. No, and um, we did that. And what happened was all the, all the clubs that we played in, um, it just, it probably still the same now. A lot of the DJs had played for the provincial radio stations. So they would go to their respective radio station in the day and go, well, last night at the club, we had this band, Gordon Romance has played them. So Radio Harrow would play radio, they all the different places. But in the end, it got to the stage where so many of the smaller stations were playing it, that only Radio 1, Capital, Radio 2, were the only ones that weren't playing Modern Romance. So they thought, well, we'll better start playing this song and see how it goes. Well, of course, that then raised the level of, you know, people knowing that we're around. Yeah. It was on the record. Then we, once we broke into the top 40, then we got invite, top of the box. And that was it. We were off and running after well, that. Listen, it, it was a great sound, and, and I was uh, dancing along to it as well. So we had Everybody Salsa and I, 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 I Moosey, um, Best Years of Our Lives. I mean, they're all great songs to to dance to. So that must have been a superb period of your life. So moving along a, a, a little bit, you, you, would, you were doing all of this, you were doing all these clubs, you were doing Top of the Pops, making all these records, but then it kind of turned sour. How long did you have as a, as a band um, that was really getting on together and, and getting on well and enjoying what you were doing. When did all that start to go wrong, Andy? Do you know what, the getting on part of it wasn't really much of an issue. Um, for me personally, one of the issues was the fact that we were traveling the world, doing what we were doing, and I was only able to do that by virtue of the fact that I lived with my parents, because if I had a flat somewhere, I wouldn't be able to do that. I'd have to go and get a job because we weren't getting any money. It was the way it was structured at the time. We were creating lots of money. We were generating, our records were generating loads of money, but it wasn't through to and down to us. Long story, but you know, it's one of those things. It's one of those great rock and roll swindles that there are hundreds of. That we just, that was happening a lot in the 80s, wasn't it? Yeah, and we're just another one of those. People. I mean, I know it was happening for a while to George Michael, but he was very fortunate that he got, um, new management, and they pushed the other guys away and said, how much do you want? Said, there you go, take that, get lost. And then they took him to another level as well. But um, there are loads of musicians that we can talk, I mean, I know, I know Gilbert O'Sullivan when he was having all these yeah. things, he made no money. And it's ridiculous, someone can have all those number ones, uh, be on every TV show you can imagine where they have live acts and not have any money. Well, I think, I think even Prince ended up changing his name to a symbol, didn't he? Because uh of a fallout with his, with his record company. Um, right. And that was over the amount, I believe it was over the amount that, that he was being paid. You, you were all getting a very, very small amount. I know, it was it ABC, I think, went through it as well. Um, I don't know if ABC went through it. I've never, I, I don't know, I should, not, I should not ask Martin when I see him. I didn't know that, but I, there were others, there were other people, but we were one of the ones, I mean, to have someone coming up to a gig, I actually had this happen, somebody walked up to me, and this girl, we were chatting, she's been, oh, can I have your autograph? She went, I bet you're really loaded. And I thought, love, if you knew, you probably wouldn't speak to me because you, you think, well, he's poorer than I am, you know. But um, listen, I, despite what happened on the financial side of things, I don't regret one single day and one single thing of it. And I remember when, I, when the band broke up and, you know, people would meet me two, three years down the line and they'd say, you're the guy more romance, yeah, yeah. You know, and then we talk, and that's, I'll be very honest, I've always been honest, that's one of my, uh, maybe that's one of my failings, I'm honest, to, that's it, end of story. Uh, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, but people would say, well, you know, you didn't make any money. Aren't, aren't you really bitter? And I was, who's got time for that? I'm gonna be, what, so I'm gonna be bitter from the day I leave the band to the day I'm 90 when I die. How's that gonna help anyone? So no, it is what it is, that's it. Um, so I was able to shake that off, but whilst it was going, it was fantastic, and there was not really a time, I mean, listen, there were little spats, but generally the band all got on well, we had fun, it really was that sort of one for all and all for one bit, especially 
when the second singer joined the band, because the, the singer that I saw it when I first went to see them at the Bridge House was a bitch. But then another singer joined, because he left within, a, within in about a year, he left. Another singer joined, who was absolutely, um, I mean, we sat down and we realised we had Earth, Wind and Fire and song music in, in, uh, in, you know, in common. But apart from that, he was a fantastic singer. He could do those things, which meant that we could now record songs like Just My Imagination, Abraham, Martin and John, um, Dance to the Music, you know, Sly and the Family Stone. We did recordings of all these songs that we could never have done with the other guy. I mean, it's great for me because we're back to my soul roots. We're playing soul music, you know. Um, and he was such a good singer. He was such a good singer that when James Ingram did Yum Will Be There on Top of the Pops, Michael McDonald couldn't make it to do his bit. There's a little bit on Little Cameo. Yeah, yeah. I know, yeah, I know that song really well. I love that well, song. Michael McDonald couldn't come. So that, our singer was asked to go and do it on Top of the Pops because he could do it. And he went and did that. He did the Michael McDonald bit. What was his name? Michael J. Mullins, great singer, great singer. Um, but yeah, generally we all got on well when it was fun and um, we'd have sing songs in, in the van, you know, in the, on the tour bus on the way to wherever we're going. And it was good fun. There, it was never one of these bands where there was, there, there were lots of, you know, a, a, there'd be a frat bar backstage and there was someone who would have killed someone. It wasn't like that. So what, what, what caused the, the cracks then? Because, um, I mean, Modern Romance was by no means on its own. There were a lot of 80s bands that went through the 80s um, and enjoyed really good hits and uh, a lot of appearances that then started to form, form cracks later on. Spandau Ballet is a perfect example of that. So when, when did that happen for you? Was that late 80s or mid 80s? I, I, well, I think that the thing is, with the culture being the way it was at the time, and you're, you're hearing this from somebody who doesn't drink, doesn't smoke, has never done drugs. But I think that had a lot to do with things not going the way they should have gone. Uh, our manager was into anything and everything. And I don't think when you've got somebody that represents a band who's going to go out and get slossed and make an idiot of yourself, I don't think that's really you know a good reflection on the band because people go well if we want to deal with this band we have to deal with him because he's the manager and he's a pain so let's not bother and i think at that point what happened was we we went from warner brothers to rca yep rca um and rca very quickly realized he, obviously i think wa warner brothers had a kind of loyalty and allegiance to us because we'd been there and made it with them and they'd seen us all the way through all yeah. of a sudden we go to this new record label and we've got management making demands and you know a couple of band members who have a bit the worse to wear for drink and or drugs getting stroppy here then everywhere and they sort of thought you know what we don't need this so when they get phone calls and people say well what bands have you got free for Chevis plays pop or you know razzmatazz one of the tv shows that are out of time they'd say well we've got you know um, dollar we've got this, uh, you know, whatever we've got, like ABC, but, but nobody would mention Modern Romance because they know that putting Modern Romance forward to a TV show might bring other other problems. You know, you go back and oh, this is the backstage, right? We're not doing the gig, or the manager going, well, no, we're not having it. We're not having, you know, and so it started um, to affect your reputation. Yes, and I think I think that's why the 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 first single that we put out with RCA was a flop, even though it was, even though it, it was just as good, slightly different, but just as good in the same way as what had come before. It was dancey, it was, you know, chanty, everything. But I don't think he got the push that he should have, that he got when we were with, with Warners. And that's because pushing the record and pushing a band means you have to get the TV appearances. That means they have to be in contact with people and their management has to be in contact with people. We, as a record company, had to be in contact with the management. They just get so... And did that did that cause friction between the members of the band? Then is is that what? No, I, I think no. I just think everyone kept becoming a bit disillusioned, and I I in particular became disillusioned because we were on a tour, and it suddenly occurred to me that well, I'm not home. I haven't been home for ages. I've been on this tour, and you know UK tour, but I thought I'd have done all these gigs, 
if I'm going home with absolutely nothing, or I'm getting still getting the money that I get paid on a weekly basis, which was not even three figures. Let's put it that way. Less than a hundred quid. Um, so, so this just, is when your parents wished you were still at the bank, is it? Well, my, my parents at the time um, thought, well, whatever money he gets, he can keep it. We don't want money from him because it's great to put parents. It tends to be like that. I'm like that with my son. Whatever he earns, I don't want any money from staying here with my son. He can give me whatever happened. But I don't think they had any idea of how little I was getting. Because remember, I was out every single night and they thought, well, he must be getting loads of money. He's He's going to stream for loads every night. Yeah, because I get him for free. I could not afford to pay to go to stream for loads. It wasn't going to happen. Not even once a week I'd pay, I'd pay to go in there because that's basically a quarter of my week's money just to pay to get in. So I'm not paying to do that. Because so, I got him for free. Basically living off freebies then well, because I, of people knowing you from the... From... I was living off my reputation. But yeah. the downside of it is you go somewhere like um, stream for loads, and you see lots of people in there that you know, like people from other bands, whatever. They go, oh, let me buy you a drink. You know, no, 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 I've just had one, thanks. You know, because you know that if they buy you a drink, eventually, I'll buy one back. I one back. And <laughs> I can't afford to buy a round of drinks. And I can't even afford to buy one drink in Stream Club, let alone a round. So um, that was a sad side of things. So, yeah. so, so when did the band? What year did the band actually break up? And then what happened to you after that, Andy? What did you do straight afterwards? I left in 85, 85 or 86. Basically, we were on a tour and I said, when this tour finishes, we are on the last week of it. And I said, oh, I got, yeah, we had one more week to do. And I said, look, when this is over, I'm leaving. And then the singer who I told you about earlier, the good one who joined up, Mick, Mick Mullins, said, well, if he's leaving, I'm leaving as well then. Because, you know, I think he'd become just as disillusioned as well with the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, working for free sort of thing and giving people lots of pleasure but not being able to afford any of the luxuries in life that normal working people get and yet here we are you know the pinnacle of success allegedly you know making and making all this money no we're not we're not making any money at all so he left and i think <clears throat> yeah the band carried on for a short while afterwards very short while we were trying to release a couple of singles that didn't do anything and then um like an old coat, the name was just hung up there and left. And everyone went about doing their own business. And I started doing, you're asking me what I was doing. Yeah. I, did, I did some sessions, which like, I did some stuff with um, Craig McLaughlin. Remember him? Yeah. Neighbours? Yeah. Uh, Henry, yes, it was Craig Henry. Well, he had a bit of a pop career going on. Yeah, I remember that. But when he came to England, I was working with him. Um, I did some stuff with Boy George, I did some stuff with Angie Gold, I don't know if you remember her. Yes. Um, I was supposed to work with um, the, the, was it the Nolans? I think it was the Nolans at one point. Uh, yeah, it almost happened, but it, it didn't work out. But yeah, I was doing anything coming on, I was, doing, I was just doing sessions, basically. Um, so at, what, at what point, because obviously you stayed in the music business, you still had the love of music, at what point did you think, I want the modern romance name back and I want to, I, I want to do this again. Well, I didn't so much think, I didn't actually make the decision that I want the modern romance name back. I just thought it was time because a lot of um, the 80s music was coming back and that they yeah. were having, you know, blah, blah night with, you know, Odyssey or someone, I think. And Odyssey were actually before us as well, in the, the 70s. But, you know, now they're moving to 80s music. Um, Okay, so I got in touch with Dave James, who was the bass player, and the owner of the name after the other guy had left, because they started the band together. But the other guy left, so the name stayed with Dave, and we, you know, we, we all were modern romance still, sort of thing. So I phoned up Dave, and I just got in touch with him after, this is after many years, and I said, um, let's meet and have a chat. He went, oh, and so um, I said, look, you know, such and such is happening with the Asian music, it's making the resurgence there. I think it's the right time for us to relaunch Modern Romance, you know, get the band back together, you know, me and you and whoever, whichever our members want to join. Um, well, for starters, his brother Rob, who was a keyboard player, was now had a family, a day job, you know, he wasn't going to risk all that by joining a band to see what happens. Because obviously, you know, you'd have to rehearse and this and that. 
yeah. and he's in Suffolk, so it's miles away from anywhere. So um, the trumpet player, John Dupre, who went on to write the music for A Fish Called Wanda, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, One Foot in the Grave, who wrote the theme music for that, he's written loads of stuff. Um, he lives between London and LA, so I said, that's not right. But, but, so they said to me, look, he said, me personally, I can't see myself going on stage again. He said, I'm, I'm, you know, he's into management, he still does it now. He said, um, I, I really can't see myself doing that again. But he said, as an original member, I see no reason why you can't take the name and be Modern Romance and get whoever you want with you. If you want to you know, use some members of the, past members of the band, you can or you can do what you want. The name yours. And the one thing he said to me, I, I, this is one of those things that people say to you that always remain, and, you know, that, that the actual phrase they use. And um, remember, the 80s was a time of um, excess and everyone was going bananas, you know, doing drugs, drinking, whatever, getting mad, they're partying. Um, and, I mean, and people talk about the 60s, so what the 80s were, the 60s was LSD, the 80s was coke, so what's the difference, you know? But um, he said to me, look, I did some stuff in the 80s that I'm not very proud of. So the least I could do is give you the name and anything you want, any help you want in the future, because I'd always be there for you. And you know what? Guy was being true to his word. He's been a great mate. I've met up with him you know, many, many times since then. Um, we've had dinner together so many times. Um, and a couple of times I've needed him. He said, yeah, what do you need? Right, bang, he's been there. Um, so we are basically, since that meeting in 1999, we have stayed friends, um, good friends. But is, sadly, having that name um, and being given that name in, in that way, so that you owned that name, it didn't stop the court cases happening, did it? No, and the funny thing is, well, um, he gave me the name and I said, look, do me a favour, I said, I know you're giving it to me, can we do a contract? That we can both sign and you can, he goes, yeah, whatever. And I said to him, just for safety's sake, because you never know, because we knew there was one person in the band who we, we knew his brother wouldn't be stopping. We knew John Dupre wouldn't be stopping. Um, so that left two people, and one in particular was a singer that left. And we just knew that he might get stroppy one day. Well, he waits 18 years and then serves me with a cease and desist. And I thought, are the drugs still clouding your head, mate? 18 years. Where have you been? Um, so without going into the, uh, into the specifics of it, he basically registered the name of the band with the Intellectual Property Office, who themselves were a joke, I'm sorry, because they didn't even check. I mean, all you have to do is go on the internet. It's not, you've got Agent Fox Media behind you. I guarantee you, if I went to register Agent Fox Media, they'd look in their books and go, Agent Fox Media, no one's registered that, yeah, we can register that. If they typed in Agent Fox Media on the internet, it would come up straight away and they'd go, someone's already using it, mate, can't let you have it. No, they just take it on board that, because I've got registered with them, that no one's got it. They give him the name, he then decided to start writing to agents and threatening to sue them if they book my modern romance. The agents are then calling me and saying, well, look, we've got these gigs for you, but we don't know what to do. Because this guy's threatening to sue us. We don't know, you know, we don't want to get involved. And we know you're modern romance, but he says he owns the names, the right to the name and blah, blah. So, and you could see that he'd only registered it two months earlier. It's like, hello, you really think you're going to win this? Anyway. So ultimately I won. I got the, the name. How long, how long did these court cases go on, Andy? Two years. So two, so two years. years of all of that, but you eventually came out the winner yeah. and you still and own the name Modern still, Romance and you and are still in his Modern Romance. There's copious amounts of egg on his face, I'm glad to say. But it's his own doing, his own stupidity. It was him and the, and the old guitarist. But how they ever thought they were going to get away with this, I don't know because, I mean, they were found, the, the, the intellectual property office found them guilty of Registering the name in bad faith, which means he never had the right to make to register in the first place. And they also said he was passing off because we had more hits after he left than when he was there. And then he wants to go out as modern, modern romance. Um, 
and they think, oh, it's the modern romance, they did the best years of their lives in high life. And no, it wasn't in the band. So, and, and the, the funny thing was, um, he got a girl in the band to sing all those songs because the originals were in too high, too high a register for him to sing. He can't sing where they, these songs are. So he got a girl in to do those songs. So what's the point? The, the whole thing was... The, the, the good thing is that you go out as modern romance now and, and have done for quite a while. I, I've seen you um, and uh, I'm dancing away just as much as I used to in the 80s because there's all the old stuff that I know, but you've got new music as well. So tell us a little bit about the, the new music that you're making as modern romance. New music is... Um... It's still, it's still Latin based, but as opposed to being everyone have at the time Latin, it's more without being derogatory to the old Latin, it's more genuine Latin in that it's, it, it sounds like it, it probably may have had you know, a Latino involved in the writing, but that's probably maybe the Greek side of me. There's, there's a, you know, the Greek <laughs> side musically, we, you know, we, we tend to be a bit different, they, they're different scales as well sometimes. So, um, so, yeah, it's a, it's, a, it's a direction whereby, you know, it's, it's still the Latin thing, but it's, I, I say to people, it's more like modern romance grown up. It's like, yeah, yeah. modern romance in its No, I, I've, I've heard it, and I think that's probably a, a, a good way of uh, explaining it to everybody. And we'll, we'll put a link on with this broadcast so that people can have a listen to themselves. So the lineup of, of the band now includes your daughter, doesn't it? It does. Um, and I have to say, I have to stress, um, she's there on merit, not because she's my daughter. Um, <laughs> and I say I can that. Hear and see that. Yeah, yeah, I say that because um, my son, for example, plays drums. But even if he wanted to be in the band, he couldn't be because he's not good enough. Having said all that, he only plays as a hobby. I'm sure if he sat down and applied himself, he would be good enough eventually. But he doesn't want to be. He said, Dad, I enjoy playing drums when I enjoy playing. I don't want to make it a job and I don't want the strip of it, you know, having to learn songs and make sure I don't make a mistake. And he plays freely and if he makes a mistake, he makes a mistake, that's fine. But um, so that I, I use that example with my son just to say that if Nax was a good singer, that's not good enough for me. You have to be a really good singer to be in the band. You have to know what you're doing, hold your own. And to be honest, um, <clears throat> she first sang in the band when she was 15. Um, and that came about when we were doing, uh, I think it was a Lou Festival. And you know, it's really funny because sometimes the obvious things right in your face for ages and you don't see it. But because she was my daughter and she was young, it never occurred to me that I was going to be singing in the band. Um, and then one day someone said something, and sort of the way your mind works, you yeah. went down little avenues very, very quickly. And then I thought, why have I never thought of Nats coming to sing with us? Why am I paying an unknown session singer to come and do backing vocals when Nats can do backing vocals? So I thought, I oh, know, I'll bring her along with the backing singer. So we can do backing vocals together and I'll let Nats do a couple of solo spots. So I asked her and she said, yeah, I'm up for that. 15, right? So I thought, okay. So I um, took her along. She was great. I mean, one of the first songs she did was a Whitney Houston song. And everyone kind of thought, wow, she's doing Whitney Houston and doing it well. But um, I knew because I'd hear her singing all the time at home. But it's because she was at home and singing away in her bedroom and doing stuff, it was again the obvious right in front of me, and I never thought about it. Oh, my daughter's singing upstairs, you know. And I've listened to it, oh, she's really good, and then just carry on and not think. Uh, like no, like I say, I've, I've seen you live and I've heard Nat sing, and uh, she wowed everybody uh, the night I came along to see you. And uh, Modern Romance is still doing everything that, that everybody knows them for, and the new stuff is, is every bit as good as, as the old stuff, but you must. Be missing the gigs and festivals during this this pandemic, though. Do you know what? I've said to people, if it carries on like this, the next gig I'm going to walk on stage. You're going to give me a mic, and I'm going to go, "What's this? I don't remember. What is this? So what am I supposed to do with this? It's been so long. It's just ridiculous. Um, I miss it, 
for many, many reasons. Obviously, financially, musicians were being killed at the moment. Yeah. Because there's no furlough, there's no money from the government. They say, go and find another job. Well, let's be honest, right? Let's just be honest for one second. But for those who don't know, I'm 62, right? Who is going to hire, a, even if I went to do a course in computers, and they said, well, it will take you X amount of months to complete it, and then we can find you a job. Let's assume that I've gone and done this course. So where are we now? We're in October. Let's just say by April next year, I've done this course, and I go to look for a job. You as an employer have a choice. You've got a 62-year-old bloke who's been in a band all his life, who's a musician, and you jump at the chance to go back to playing music the minute the gigs open up again and they say, right, you can go out and do your gigs. Or should I get this 22-year-old bloke, 23, who's just got his degree in everything to do with what we're doing, and he's likely to stay here for the next five, six, eight years, who knows? I haven't got a chance to compete against that. So, you know, no, I can't, I can't see you going back to the banking either, Andy. But I'll tell yeah. you, what you what you can do um, is uh, you can become a writer. And next year, um, all of the things that we've talked about today are going to be put down in paper in detail, um, in far more detail, right from the beginning, right until what's happening now, in a book that I'm very proud to be agenting for you called Best Years of Our Lives. Um, which is the only title it could possibly have, um, and that's going to come out in 2021. So you're you're going to be doing a bit of work there, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, well, that's going to be released uh, on the 40th anniversary of Monroe Romance's first hit. So we thought it's called like 40 years. Anyway, shh, be quiet. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, that's making me feel quite old as well. Um, as you are. Um, but yeah, so I'll be transcribing the diaries that I kept at the time. And um, I, mean, I must admit, I've, I looked through them fleetingly after you and I spoke. Uh, I looked through them and I, I think, but, and there's some stuff in there that I, you know, I was cringing and going, oh my God, did I really say this in my diary? You know, um, the good thing is, well, I didn't do drugs and I didn't drink. My main focus was going out and having a good time, dancing and mingling and you know, I was young, free and single and I definitely was going to mingle, definitely, right? So, um, but you'd be surprised that even though I didn't drink and didn't smoke, there was a lot of stuff in the diary I'm going, oh, a bit close to the mark there, oh yes, yeah, because you know, I'm making little comments and I'm remembering and going, oh yeah, you know, met, and I was fortunate as well, I met loads of people, um, famous people, even if it was brief, even if it was for five minutes, have a chat and take a picture, you know, um, and then, you know, obviously bumping into um, people like, you know, Duran Duran and George Michael Baxter, you know, the green room or you know, the little beige, yeah. you know, at, at, at Top of the Pops or any other shows we did, Elton John, Rod Stewart, you know, just loads of them. Um, so loads of little bits like that that I've read. But the funny thing is there's loads of stuff that I, 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 I know I was brutally, not blatantly, brutally honest in my diary. And I'd read it and go, why don't I remember that? That's how can you forget that? And, you know, I've got a vague memory of you know, you know, some of the encounters. Let's just call them encounters. And I think how can you not remember it? But then again, it's like not being disrespectful, but you can't remember every meal you've had. How you gonna, if your encounters are that <clears throat> often, you're not gonna remember them. And I sort of think, wow. Well, you, uh, what I can say is that you have remembered a lot. I'm pretty sure before you're finished, you're gonna be remembering. A lot more and I know that there's already some great stories in there and maybe some things that we've not been able to talk about in a broadcast but um, yeah. but certainly it, it is a, is going to be a book worth reading it's going to come out next year and as you say that's the 40th anniversary of modern romance Andy it's been great talking to you always is um, there's a few too many ask many bits of Arsenal memorabilia behind you there that uh, I would have preferred not to have seen being the Spurs season ticket holder. No, I don't want to see it, Andy. No, 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 no. You've never seen Arsenal. I'd like to show you this. <laughs> I meant to bring this over. We were chatting earlier. I'm just going to introduce you. Before you go, you have to say hello to a good friend of mine all the way from America. There we go. He's one of my mates. I brought this from America with you on the plane. 
because they obviously can't put it in a suitcase. So I bought this from the States and people are going, that's Peter Griffin. I'm going, yeah, he's coming back home with me. So anyway, Peter Griffin says hello to everyone. Hello everyone. Right. Okay, well, we'll, 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 <laughs> we'll, say, um, we'll say a farewell to you and to Peter Griffin. Andy Kiriaku, Modern Romance. Thank you very much. Take care. Okay, mate. See you soon. Bye. So um, that was uh, a, a great chat with Andy. We always do have great chats together, but the book will be out next year. And uh, a lot of those stories are going to be in uh, far more detail. And as I said, some of those things that uh, are in there couldn't be talked about in, in a broadcast, but are all to do with uh, the life of a pop star in the 80s and beyond. So thank you uh, everyone once again for listening to this ninth edition of In the Foxy's Den and we look forward to seeing you next time. Take care. I've just gotta say, oh, 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 makes me wanna dance. Oh, 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 it's a new romance.